and welcome to the latest episode of Are You Kidding Me? I am Naomi Schaefer Riley, and I'm a resident fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute. And I'm Ian Rowe, a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And today we have joining us, maybe known to many of you listeners, Brad Wilcox from the University of Virginia. We have a lot to talk about with Brad today. Yeah. So, Brad, it's great to connect with you. You know, in the last couple of months, there have been some extraordinary editorials in the New York Times saying that the myth of the two-parent family, and then David Brooks had this remarkable essay in the Atlantic magazine calling the nuclear family a mistake. And Brad, you know, you have committed your entire life to talking about the importance of marriage. You're the head of the National Marriage Project. You lead the Institute for Family Studies. You're a senior fellow there. And yet there's these questions now about the role of family, the importance not only to culture, but at the root of so many issues that we are all concerned with around economics, criminal justice reform. There's so many connections back to family. And yet there seems to be this chipping away at the importance of the nuclear family. What's your response to what is happening here? Yeah, well, it is obviously somewhat dispiriting that these stories, including the one in the New York Times you mentioned about the myth of the two-parent you know, family, have cropped up in even the last you know, couple of months here. I think we're always kind of engaged in the sort of Sisyphean task of pushing back at many in media and academia who want to kind of basically minimize the importance of married parents, who want to kind of basically embrace this idea of you know family diversity, this idea that sort of every flavor of family life is just as good as the other. That's the challenge that faces us here. I think at the same time that we have to recognize that whatever our elites might say in public, you know, and for the New York Times, you know, the irony is that they're likely themselves to marry today and have their own kids in marriage and remain stably married. I mean, this is sort of the paradox or the irony, I should say, and that is that many of these elites who are writing about these things and sort of pushing this family diversity idea or this idea that family structure is not that important actually vote with their own feet in a rather different direction. And so... I really like, Brad, sorry to interrupt, but I really like the anecdote that actually Brooks used when he was talking about you in his article in your classes. Maybe you could kind of describe like this little vote that you took or that maybe you take every year about, you know, how students feel about out of wedlock birth, for instance. Yeah, it's striking. So I teach a very large class at the University of Virginia called the Sociology of the Family. And I have this device called a clicker that allows me to poll my students anonymously. And so I can kind of get their votes on a bunch of things, you know, and they don't have to worry about knowing, you know, that I know what they think. And so one thing I do in the middle of class is I ask students in the fall before Thanksgiving break, I say, you know, is anyone here morally opposed to having a child outside of wedlock? And a clear majority of the class, I mean, year after year after year says, no, they're not morally opposed to that. And the very next slide, I asked them, you know, would your parents freak out if you came home for Thanksgiving break and informed them that you or your girlfriend was pregnant? And when I asked them that question, like 95, 97% of them said that, yes, their parents would freak out if that news was delivered at the Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> table. And, it, and it's just as a kind of a private, public orientation here, a gap between those two things that's, that's really salient for our elite. And we also see the sort of same pattern in California. We did a survey with UGov and found, again, that a clear majority of California-educated, college-educated elites have no problem with nominal childbearing and, and embrace family diversity in public. But you ask them, you know, do they personally want to have their kids in marriage? And then a clear majority of them, you know, personally want to have their kids in marriage. And a clear majority of them in California are stably married with kids. So it's just kind of striking about how this, you know, yeah. public-private thing is, is playing out. I mean, why do you think it is that so many folks are so hesitant to preach what it is that they're practicing in their own lives? I mean, there was a time so where... So judgmental, Ian. Oh, well, are you kidding me? This is not judgmental. I mean, I mean, nothing yet. <laughs> yes, really. I mean, there was a time where even kids' answer to the first question would be that they would be ashamed to have a child out of wedlock. So what has it that's changed so significantly that makes people not want to embrace the social norms that they're practicing in their own lives? 
Well, you know, Ian, I think that the cultural revolutions of the 60s and 70s really kind of undercut this idea. I mean, especially first it was like divorce. You know, you, it used to be like you went divorced for the sake of the kid. And that, you know, that just disappears in the 70s with the divorce revolution. And then we see a similar dynamic playing out with non-marital childbearing, you know, in that same period. So you get rid of all these older taboos and norms, and then you add in more recently like a concern to sort of celebrate diversity for reasons related to both race and immigration, I think. And that's extended then the family structure, you know, as sort of like the next logical place where we should deploy this sort of diversity argument, you know, this sort of diversity inclusion argument. And so you've got, you know, reasons related to sort of desire to be tolerant, to be affirmative, to sort of signal your, you know, your modernity, and to dispense, of course, with older ideas rooted in, you know, archaic religious notions about, you know, sex. So all these kinds of cultural currents come together to erode a strong public ethic around marriage and family stability, right, in public. But I think what happened in private is that a lot of smart people realize, you know, in the wake of the divorce revolution of the 1960s and 70s was that, hey, you know what, getting divorced, you know, having a lot of family instability is not very smart for me, you know, for my spouse, especially for our kids. In my own life, right. Yeah. So they just realize, you know, we're just not going to do that thing in private, you know. And so it's the same thing we see with like technology that Naomi is about. Like Steve Jobs, you know, basically says he's not going to let his kids have an iPad. And yet he's like earning billions of dollars selling them to other people's kids. So the same kind of thing with family. Like they realize that, you know, for themselves and their kids, the best thing is a stable marriage. But they're not willing to support that public ethic because it's politically inconvenient to do that today. That's, that's, it's just, just sort of a tragic but true, I think, dynamic playing out. I wanted to ask you, Brad, to kind of turn to the Brooks piece a little bit more in depth. So he has this very sort of clever way at the beginning of kind of talking about what I think a lot of people, even in stable nuclear families, feel, which is this kind of shrinking of the family, putting of all the pressure on even the, the two parents, you know, the smaller and smaller Thanksgiving dinner table or just the Sunday dinner table. And I think that even people, you know, in the middle and upper classes who are in stable nuclear families are feeling this. He talks about how, you know, in order to meet the needs that maybe grandparents or neighbors would have fulfilled 50 years ago and helping you care for your kids and have a more reasonably relaxed lifestyle. Now you have to pay for the nanny and pay for the tutor and pay for everything. And you're, you know, working on the hamster wheel in order to try to make that happen. And I was wondering kind of what you made of that description, whether you think it's accurate and where David Brooks's analysis, you sort of say, kind of goes off the rails a little bit. So I think that Brooks's analysis is correct in terms of arguing that basically raising a family you know, supporting a family is really challenging. And to have, like, grandparents, uncles and aunts helping, not to mention a larger community, helping with that or with those set of tasks, practical, financial, emotional, et cetera, is wonderful. And we have lost a lot of that kinship and a lot of that, you know, care for community sort of standing behind us since the 1970s. As we all know, there's been a dramatic decline in civic engagement in religion, for instance, one example of that playing out, too. So I think his diagnosis is largely on target, although I don't think he sufficiently kind of explains how like changes in, in family law, for instance, and changes in norms around, you know, sex and marriage and changes in the economy, you know, around men's capacity to earn a decent family wage. And fertility, also really, too. Well, yeah, fertility, too, have changed sort of the calculus here. So, but anyways, I think his diagnosis is largely on, on, on the money, but I think his, his prescriptive agenda at the end is one that I disagree with. He talks about the importance of kind of just relying upon kin to help raise kids without bio parents and what he calls families of choice. And that could be sort of any group of adults helping to raise kids. It's just not, I think, practical on the one hand, nor is it really attentive to the social science, which tells us that. Yeah, also, isn't there the data just overwhelming that the environments that are best for children are a stable married two-parent home? Like, why is it so difficult for us to just objectively share information about the best environments for kids? Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, we talk about in my Atlantic piece, how boy, just the way in which we know like that single moms living with, with a grandma do as badly as single moms living on their own when it comes to outcomes like teen pregnancy. And we show that, you know, kin don't compare to bio parents when it comes to raising adolescents, you know, in our in our piece. So the science doesn't sit with 
you know, Brooks's prescriptive agenda in the last part of that Atlantic piece. I think it's hard for us though, to, to talk about these things again, Ian, in public because we don't want to come across as being intolerant, you know, in some way to families that don't, for one reason or another, measure up to that standard of the intact married family. I mean, to Brooks' defense, I mean, he says that one of the reasons he wrote the essay was that usually this topic is normally focused on by conservatives, like the impact of the decline in families. And so somehow that has turned off more left-leaning, more progressive folks from even talking about this. So he says that his effort to do this article was to try and get this conversation back in the province of progressives as well. How do we do that? I think one way we do it is by talking about how stable families serve the welfare of girls and women. And, you know, we know that girls are more likely to be thriving in school and even the labor force is 20-somethings if they're raised by, you know, stably married parents. My work with Bob Lerman shows that. We know actually today that the motherhood wage penalty based upon some work at Columbia is smaller today for married women than it is for other women, in part because today's dads are a lot more, you know, helpful on the home front than was the case, you know, 50 years ago. So there are ways that you kind of can tell the family story that are kind of particularly sort of positive for girls and for women. That's one part of the story. I think another thing to sort of stress is the way in which stable families advance the cause of social justice and racial equality. We know, for instance, that black kids are raised in intact married families are suspended less in school than white kids who are raised in non-intact families, you know. So a lot of our concerns about like wait, racial... Wait, wait, Brad, say that again. Because, you know, when folks talk about, for example, school discipline or suspensions, it's almost always on the dimension of race. But you've just raised a very interesting piece of information, which is once you control for a family structure, you get very different outcomes. So say that one more time. Right. So what Nicholas Zill and I have found in our research is that African-American kids who are raised in intact married families are less likely to be suspended compared to their white peers who are raised in non-intact families. You know, so there's, huge, there's a big racial disparity, as you both know, in, in school suspensions. Blacks are more likely to be suspended than whites. And I think part of that story is about racism, but I think a lot of the story is also about other things, including family structure. And again, it's just striking to know that Black kids are having the benefit of you know being raised in an intact married family are doing better on this sort of school front you know than their white peers who are being raised in non-intact families. I mean, as someone who runs schools, you know this is at the crux of the debate. Most folks, when they see that same data that you're talking about, the differences, the disparities by race in terms of discipline, basically make the assumption that that the causality is either implicit or explicit bias of teachers. And so, how do we expand this conversation to say, well? Maybe there's that, but it sounds like the structure and stability of the family in which these children are being raised is a significant contributing well, factor as well. There's also just a chicken and egg thing here. I mean, how many commentators are reluctant to talk about family structure in this way because they think it's white people lecturing black people about how to structure their families? And I don't want to cast aspersions on David Brooks here, but I, you know, this does feel a little bit like the soft bigotry of low expectations for black families. Like we can't hold them to these high standards of, you know, nuclear families that white people have. So we should just give up and, you know, try kibbutzes. And then that was sort of the impression that I walked away from the article with. And I think it's very disappointing, especially with you know, the work Ian is trying to do and other people are trying to do with, you know, reintroducing people to all of the great things that come from having intact families and married parents. And by the way, not every white family is the nuclear family. I mean, Brad, you may want to comment on this. It's not as if there is universal stability in, in white communities. Yeah, but wh- rich white people right. have much easier time lecturing poor white people. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> Less guilt. And- right. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, we've seen, obviously, since the 1980s, a dramatic increase in cohabitation and family stability and single parent among poor and working class whites. And as we all know, that the effects of that instability is much like what we've seen with African-American families since the late 1960s. So, yeah, this is not a black problem. It's a universal problem now in America, but it is concentrated among working class and poor Americans. But it's for that reason, too, that it tends to deepen a lot of the economic and racial inequalities that all of us across the spectrum would like to reduce. There's emerging science as well in terms of the environments and kids are being raised. And from even from brain development perspective, Is that another way in which we can bring conservatives and progressives together around this issue that 
every kid, regardless of race, particularly in ages zero to three as you're being raised, the stability of the home that you're being raised in has a huge impact on the lifelong outcomes for kids. Is that a pathway forward in terms of bringing progressives and conservatives together on this issue? Yeah, I would hope so, too. I think there's also, I mean, everyone wants more involved dads. One leader on this issue of talk, he's like, well, I you say, do you want more involved dads? And everyone said, nod. And you're like, would you like to see dads like engage with their kids basically on a daily basis on things like homework, on the weeknights and, you know, sports and weekends, everyone's head nods. And he's like, well, do you <laughs> recognize that the one way we can get dads involved in their kids' lives on a day-to-day basis is by increasing the number of dads who are married. Have I got the answer for you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, okay, you kind of bring them along piece by piece. And you're saying, you start with just like the recognition across the spectrum that involved dads are better than non-involved dads. Yeah. And so then you just go to basically point out how, you know, across all family types, race, economics, et cetera, dads are more involved when they're married to the mother of the kid. Absolutely. You know, a lot more involved. Yeah. I mean, the so. bottom line is all family types are not equal when it comes to raising children. And so, Brad, final question. If we know that family structure really matters significantly to the lifelong outcomes of a child, when you think about the next generation, I know you've talked a lot about the success sequence research that shows that if a child or a young adult follows the pathway of finishing their education, full-time work, marriage, then children, 97% of the people who followed that series of decisions in that order avoid poverty. If we know that, what's the rationale for not sharing that information with kids, even in a non-prescriptive way? I don't think there's a good rationale. I mean, the one argument that I hear from progressives is it's really about full-time employment. Sort of the issue here is work not marriage. If we can just sort of ensure that there's a worker working full-time in our families, of course, what that doesn't acknowledge, doesn't recognize, this is an argument Matt Brunick has made, by the way, is that we're much more likely to find a full-time worker in a married household. It's much easier for a couple raising a kid together to have at least one of the parents, you know, stably connected to the workforce. Whereas when you have a single parent, usually a single mom, it's just harder for her to kind of manage all the things that parents have to manage in terms of childcare and housework and paid work, you know, and she's much more likely not to be able to work full time or to maximize her connection, her devotion to the labor force. So even when you control for things like parental education, parental labor force participation, you still find that the impact of marital status is pretty powerfully connected to young adults' odds of being a poor. So the people who are putting marriage before the baby carriage are 60% less likely to be poor as young adults today in their late 20s and early 30s. compared that's to the a, And that's across race. And that's across race. That's net of controls for things like, you know, race and even employment. So I'm just saying there's a unique effect of sequencing marriage and parenthood that we don't talk about today when it comes to the economic well-being of young men and young women. Well, Brad, thank you. That is very compelling data. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. This has been another episode of Are You Kidding Me? I'm Naomi Schaefer Riley. And I'm Ian Rowe. And you can download episodes of this podcast on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month on our AEI website or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. Until next time.